Hello and welcome to this short video tutorial series on Flame. Uh, my name is Stuart and I'm going to be your host over the next six videos on an introduction on how to use Flame. In this particular case we're using Flame 2018 which is the shipping version at the time of these recordings. So I'm guessing you're kind of here because you maybe want to be looking at trialing Flame or looking at adopting it as your main tool for your work. Um, and what is Flame? Well, in the leaflet, Flame says it's a finishing system. And really what that means is that it can pretty much cover a multitude of tasks. Uh, we can work on shop based effects. We could work on commercials. We could work on long form drama and episodic work. Flame has also been used in the industry for many years on commercials and increasingly more so now on features and drama for TV. So it really you can pretty much throw anything you want to at Flame. It's a kind of a Swiss army knife piece of software. Flame also comes in a couple of flavors. It runs on Linux and it runs on Mac. Uh, for these videos, we are running on Linux, Cent OS, and we're running on a very nice custom built HP workstation uh, that the guys at Escape Technologies have put together. So it's a Z840 uh, running uh, NVIDIA M6000 graphics uh, with an internal SSD RAID. So it's very fast and it's very powerful. And if you're gonna be looking, at adopting Flame as your primary tool, uh, for your day-to-day -day work then certainly it's worth having a chat with uh, the boys and girls up at escape to see if they can kind of uh, put together a configuration that fits exactly what you need anyway without further ado uh, let's get into the software let's see what it's about and let's get over some basic concepts so this first video that we're going to be looking at is going to be initial concepts what the interface is how you start working with it so pretty much if you've just installed the software from scratch, this is really where you're going to be when you first start the software up. You're going to be on the splash screen. So Flame is a project and user driven application, uh, which means that we have different projects that we can choose and we can have different users. Users generally hold all the preferences for how the interface looks. It's a customization that you want as a user and how you want to work. And projects store all the metadata and media and locations for the particular project that you want to work on. Like I said, this is going to be nothing massively in depth. So there's going to be some things that, you know, we're going to maybe look at in a later series of uh, tutorials. Um, but by and large, this is where we're going to be starting off. So host computer, just don't worry. You know, when you did the install, it's probably going to ask you where you want to locate your media cache, your media storage for your intermediate renders and for your caching. Uh, down here, it's going to default to that. So don't worry about this. Um, but we do have to create some projects and users to kind of get started. So let's look at the project tab to start with. Now, this is where all your projects would appear. And like I said, as this is a fresh install, there is no projects here, no users. So we're going to have to make one to start off with. So if we click the new button, it brings us into new project creation window. Now, basically, all we're going to be using this for is to give our project a name, define the default resolution and frame rate, and choose what format um, any kind of caching or renders or intermediate processes get stored on that media folder uh, that we created when we installed the software. So um, just to start off, we're gonna give this a name. So we're gonna call this um, a Flame Intro. And I'm gonna ask to be excused now for any typos that I do. Um, once again, fields that we're gonna skip over quickly, things like nickname, uh, this relates to some token um, system inside of Flame that we can use a bit later on, but we're not going to worry too much about that at the moment. Uh, the same about the volume, we're just going to leave that at the default. This is the volume that you created when you installed the software, and by and large, you're only going to have one. So let's just leave that. Um, we're also going to leave the setup directory in setup mode to its default as well, right? When we create a new project, we want Flame to create a whole brand new directory structure inside of the, uh, the project home where it's going to store all our settings. Okay, so we don't really want to monkey about that. We don't want to copy any settings from anything else. We want to have a new fresh set of folders and directories where everything that we do is going to get saved into. Now, the thing we do have to concentrate on a little bit is the next stage, which is really to do with the resolution and the frame rate of the project. And there's a couple of ways you can kind of look at this. Um, I generally think about this as what is going to be my main primary deliverable for the work that I'm doing inside of Flame. Now, Flame is multi-resolution, it's multi-bit depth, and it's also multi-frame rate capable. 
So um, you can't really output a clip that's going to be all three of those. So at some point you're going to have to say, well, you know, whatever I'm working on, I'm going to be outputting this. It's going to be 2K or it's going to be Ultra HD or it's going to be HD. But you, you kind of make a decision. And that's probably a good way to approach the decision that you make here about the resolution and the frame rate. So if we click on any of these blue buttons, and you know, once again, we're gonna start introducing some conventions that run throughout the software. Anything that's kind of like a blue button, it's kind of a visual hint that there's some options underneath. And on the resolution, you can see there's a whole bunch going all the way down from the sort of like the PAL NTSC formats, all the way through the HD film up to the Ultra HD and custom resolutions at the top. So I'm going to stick on 1920 1080. Uh, when you pick any of these, um, it automatically sets according to the config, um, sort of like a predefined width and height and also ratio as well. So, you know, um, we can obviously go through and customize these custom fields. Uh, but whenever you're selecting some of the defaults, it's going to set these up automatically. Now, things like bit depth, once again, just think that this is a default. This is kind of like the standard that you probably want it to go out. So if we look under bit depth, you know, we can go all the way from 8 up to 32 bit. Um, it doesn't mean that if I choose 8 or 12 or 16 or 30, I can only work at those bit depths. This is just kind of a default. So if I just say 10 bit, because that's kind of a default for HD, that's kind of good. We can work with different bit depths inside there. Generally, uh, the format I've chosen will be progressive, but once again, you can choose uh, interlaced if you're working with interlaced footage or a deliverable. So that's kind of the resolution taken care of. The next thing we want to think about is really what frame rate or raster we want to go along uh, with that as well. So on the config template, oh, there's loads here. But basically, these are all the different rasters that tie into all the different resolutions in the previous block of entries that we just looked at. So if we go through all this, we can see that we've got everything down from um, Ultra HD, all the film reses, all the way down to PAL and everything else. Now, once again, um, depending on how you're working, whether you've got this hooked up to a network, whether you've got sync coming into the box, uh, we can work in a variety of ways. But essentially for this, I'll work at 1920, 1080, 25 progressive segmented frame, and it's on free run. So it's not going to be expecting a sync coming in. And when we set that, it's going to set uh, the frame rate underneath. Now, once again, the frame rate underneath is if Flame can't automatically detect the frame rate of the clip coming in, um, it will use this setting as a fallback and generally you probably want these two to be the same you're going to love these so uh, whenever you hover over a box let's go over the bit depth one again you're going to get these little hints coming up now when you're starting to use flame um, it's probably good to leave these on in preferences as you get more used to the interface they can become quite annoying and we can turn those off a bit later on but they are quite good because they give you a little bit of a hint about what you're hovering over it's kind of like a shortcut tip now, color policy um, in this days of multiple color spaces and color gamuts, there's a lot of colors going around. Um, you may not just be working at Rec 709. You be, may be working um, with uh, scene linear material coming in from uh, VFX and CG. You may be working or delivering film material going out as well. So this just allows you to... Um, implement an automatic color management system inside of flame and once again you can use a preset or you can copy from another project and under presets you've got uh, a couple of examples of how to use it now once again we're going to keep this simple we're going to leave it on legacy which effectively turns the color management off maybe not what you want to do as you get more advanced but at the moment like i said we're trying to keep this nice and simple just to get you started now at the bottom, the last thing we really got to uh, make some decisions on is um, the format. So you remember when uh, I keep talking about this media storage folder, you know, when you installed the software, you got asked where you want your media to go. We've got the volume here, which is the media storage again. All it really means is that when we do processes inside of Flame, when we do sort of renders or caching or intermediate processes, um, that gets saved down to that manage media folder. Now we have some decisions on how we store, what format we store that in. And once again, this is gonna depend very much on what kind of material you're working on. Um, let's just break this down quite simply. Um, these kind of top entries uh, down to legacy configuration pretty much mean everything is gonna be uncompressed in one shape, form or manner. They are gonna be the maximum quality. There's gonna be no restrictions on resolution or bit depth or anything. Now, this is good. 
um, in, in one respect it's also kind of bad because this is also going to chew up the maximum amount of space on your storage when you do those intermediate processes so you know if you're working on short stuff um, if you got maximum quality is always paramount you don't want to lose a thing then for sure you can kind of choose one of these now everything down from here in the dnx hr um, hd and also the apple prores means that those processes are going to get stored in a compressed format now compressed formats are nothing to be scared of you just got to know when to use them and you know what to choose and you can choose, as I said, either the DNX HRHDs um, or the Apple ProRes's. Now, I'm going to go for one of the Apple ProRes's, not particularly for any favoritism. It's just that I kind of like some of the Apple ProRes ones. And, you know, if you're just doing general run-of-the-mill, maybe sort of commercial work for broadcast, you could probably get away with 42HQ as being as your intermediate format. Now, whatever you select, when you choose this, it will give you a warning on if there's any restrictions on storing those renders and intermediate processes in that particularly compressed format now with with ProRes there's no actual resolution restriction um, this format can handle 10 bit and 12 bit but anything above that it can't handle or in fact below that because it's going to go to kind of 8 bit but once again don't be worried about that because if there's something that you're trying to do inside the software that that compressed format won't support um, on the media caching on the media storage folder and it's going to say that, well, if I can't do it in this, I will fall back and use the best format to store that in. So it's really like if I can't do it with this, this is what I'm going to kind of use instead. Once again, let's not get too hung up about it. But you probably need to choose something down here. And I would say just getting started, probably just trying to avoid these top ones to start with. And maybe go for one of the Apple ProRes or the DNX HR. If you want super, super quality, then obviously you can go for the quadruple fours, XQs, XQ RAWs. Uh, for this one, we're just going to stick to Apple ProRes 422 HQ. That is going to be good enough for what we are going to be doing. And once you're kind of happy with all this, uh, we're going to hit the create button. And that is going to create now my project. And that's going to appear in my project list. Now, before I start the software, I still also need to create a new user. Now the user is really um, easy. We're just going to give it a name, and that's my name. And uh, that's pretty much it. You once again, you've got the options underneath of selecting different hotkey profiles. Mm, Smoke FCP7. That is an acquired taste, as is Smoke Classic. Um, probably a good idea is just leave it on the default of Flame. It's probably the most simple, and it's also the hotkeys that we're going to be using throughout these videos as well. Uh, we can also create users, and we can also create and copy preferences from other projects, but once again, uh, for the time being, we're just going to leave it at this. And then we're going to hit Create. So now we've got a project, and now we've got a user. We can start the software, and we can have a look at the interface. So once you've started the software and uh, it's gone through the, the initialization process, using all the long words today, uh, you will be deposited here in the interface on what we call the desktop. Okay. Now, Flame initially looks quite sparse. There's none of the traditional menu bars. There's no sort of file open, file save, tools, menu bar that runs across the top and it all looks a bit sparse and it's probably like, well, where do I begin? Where is things? Which is what this first video is going to be trying to cover a lot of. So firstly, the interface is tabbed. All right. So we get deposited when we start um, Flame, probably not the most intuitive of those tabs. We get pretty much plonked on the tools tab, which is, you know, if you've got any kind of history of Flame or you know somebody's worked with it, it's pretty much how Flame used to work quite a long time ago. Um, there's still some really useful tools inside of here, but by and large, this is probably not the best place that we want to kind of start off. Uh, but it does actually give us a chance to look at how this is laid out. It's laid out in tabs. So if we kind of work backward from tools, uh, just tapping on these, we can go to batch. Um, we're going to cover batch in a later video, um, but batch is going to be our procedural compositing environment. This is where we put together no trees to do our compositing. So if you're familiar with things like Nuke or Fusion um, or Shake from way back in the day, this is a, a very similar concept. Timeline. So the timeline is basically where we are going to spend most of our time doing our work. It's where we're going to wrangle all of our media. It's where we're going to make our timelines and sequences. It's where we're going to work on our effect shots. We're going to see how that works a little bit later on. 
conforming kind of ties in with the timeline because this is a module that's going to allow us to do our conforms there's some sexy tools inside of here when we start to looking at advanced workflows that allow us to sync timelines together and then the media hub is everything to do with media so it's our it's our portal to the outside world it allows us to get media in it allows us to export media it allows us to share uh, media and projects and setups uh, with other users on the network and it also allows us to archive our job when we're completely finished with it so there's probably some things that you would want to know right off the bat where they are. So, you know, maybe you want to know how to exit the software straight away or save things. So next to the uh, the tabs at the bottom, uh, we've got some buttons here called Save, Undo, Redo. So they're fairly sort of self-explanatory. And then hidden underneath the flame icon, if you tap on that, is some submenus. So we've got, like I just said, Exit Flame. We're not going to do that just yet because we've only just started. Uh, we've got Help, which takes us to Online Help. Uh, and different options down there and we've also got things for customizing our shortcuts our keyboards and um, we've also got some resource managers background tasks and histories uh, to sort of troubleshoot things and projects and user settings and save projects um, preferences as well allows us to configure the interface um, and that when we look at the preferences is also in a tabbed format now before we do that let's just have a quick look at the general layout of the desktop as we call it so the desktop even though it may not look like it is really laid out into three pieces and we got this piece here where my cursor is at the moment uh, which we call uh, is actually the desktop this is our reels and um, what the reels are will be make a bit more sense um, soon when we start working with some media but this is really where we wrangle the clips the media that we're going to be working on for our job the area below that, when we start working with some media, is where the timeline will appear. Now, at the moment, we've got nothing in the desktop, so there's nothing appearing in this area. But effectively, think about this as, you know, if you're coming from an editing background, this is where your sequences would live. Now, this panel on the left-hand side is called the workspace panel. And the workspace panel is like a big overview of your project as far as organization of your media goes and once again this is also tabbed so we can see everything all we can see just the contents of my desktop of my library or of batch so once again we're not going to get too hung up about all this at the moment we're going to leave it on all but essentially this is an overview of really what we're working with here uh, but this is also subdivided really into two places our current working desktop here and also our libraries and they're kind of two separate entities really think of your desktop is where you're going to be working think of your libraries when we start working with some media is where we're going to save things or be able to recall um, either desktops or clips or setups um, in the future all right so one of them is for kind of working one of them is for saving things it'll make more sense when we start working with some media now flame is really big on contextual menus so there's a lot of hotkeys um, but you know we try and sort of help you along by um, exposing a lot of that in uh, a right click contextual menu so below each major area uh, there's a little cog there's not a cog here at the moment because we don't have anything in um, but if we look at the cog underneath the desktop this is going to expose um, all of the menu items that are available for my desktop area uh, and if we go into the workspace area look at the cog there that is going to expose all the tools that will be applicable to my workspace area now sometimes that's just a little bit too much to look at so we have more tailored context menus in the specific areas that we're looking at so if I come into the uh, the desktop into a reel and I right click in here you can see I get a much shorter set of options which are more applicable to where I right click so that's the contextual in the contextual as it were and this allows me to kind of make some stuff and when i've got some media start manipulating it as well so flame is only really going to start making sense when we start working with some media inside of here but before we do that maybe we want to go through and customize um, this a little bit more now the default setup is that we i for me we have like too many reels on my desktop so Let's have a quick look at preferences and see what they can kind of do for us. So preferences, now don't be frightened. There's a lot of preferences. The good news is, is that 
pretty much 99% of them are really well thought out. There's a couple here that I go through and change by default. But once again, you'll find your own way with this and you'll work out what you need to change, what you don't need to change. One thing I like to do though, if I go to the user interface, is I like to specify how many reels I'm gonna be working with. I don't really like to have all these reels in one go. So in the reels option, I can come down here and I'm gonna say, well, actually I just want to have um, three reels and I get a sequence reel here and that kind of ties in a little bit more with the batch as well. Um, also, um, there's a, a function here called friction. Now, if we just close this for a second and I come up to my desktop, and I right click on here as well and I clear my desktop, it's now going to reset to the amount of reels that I set in my preferences. So you can see that I've lost a reel. So let's start working with a little bit of media. And we're going to bring some media in from the outside world in a minute, but at the moment, let's just create some color slugs. Let's make up some bars because you can never go wrong with color bars. So if I right click in here and right at the top of the contextual menu for new, you can see I can make new sequences, sequence reels, library, shared library, well, a whole bunch of stuff. But I'm actually just going to make some colored bars. That brings me up a little pop up here as well. And what this pop up is going to do is actually it's a good indication of, you know, the, the defaults that we set for the project is it's going to adopt those project defaults to be the resolution and frame rate for my color bars. Once again, you can see that under here, I've got all the same options that I had in my uh, project settings. It's just that. This is what I set as a default. So a lot of the modules will give me that as a default. So once again, think about what you're going to be doing on your project settings, right? It will pay you dividends. So I want this to be kind of like 100 frames long. Um, I don't want any audio. I'm going to have some nice empty bars. And when I'm happy with all this, I'm going to create. And you can see the interface now comes to life. Once we have media on the desktop in the reels, then you can see that it starts to populate my timeline. This is a representation of this and it starts to populate also my workspace as well. So just to be crazy, I'm going to make another slug. In this particular case, I'm going to make some, I'm going to make a colored source and we are going to pick uh, a very nice blue and that's also going to be 100 frames and I'm going to create that. So what we've got here now is we've got uh, two pieces of media, two clips. One of them is blue and one of them is a set of color bars um, but the reason I've done this is that <clears throat> you can see that as I sort of grab these and throw them around there's sort of like a ballistics it's a bit like um, you know on your phone or on your tablet where you start scrolling things you know you can move it and it carries on drifting for a little while now like I said not everything is 100% worked out the preferences and this is the 1% thing that I personally am not too keen on so I don't like this sort of floaty motion I'd like it to just sort of stay where I put it so if I come back out to my preferences now and I go down to my user interface, I can set the friction for my reels to be 100%. So there's no, there's going to be no sort of ballistics on there at all. When I let go of it, it actually just stops. So now we've got some media on here. Um, it gets a lot more easier to explain what's happening down here as well. So this particular clip is also this timeline. You can see that it's this called blue and this is called blue. If I select this clip, then this is my empty bars. And this is my timeline for my empty bars. Now, what's probably not apparent because you know, these are just sort of static images is that I can actually touch and drag inside of the clip as well. So this in this is kind of synced. You know, this is just a thumbnail representation of this timeline. And even over here in the workspace area, this is another representation of what's on the desktop. So this is kind of like my big view. And this is like my skin down navigational view, my workspace. This is kind of what I'm working with. Now, of course, you don't really want to look at small little thumbnails all the time. You probably want to look at these in a sort of like a nice player. You, okay, you want to manipulate this. This is good for manipulating objects. You know, we can pick these up and drag these around. And when you start playing with the software, this will feel just a little bit strange initially when you kind of pick objects up moving around along the reels especially when we start looking at some of the ways that we can uh, use these clips as well i don't want you to learn all the hotkeys because your head would just explode but there's some you probably really do want to learn uh, fairly quickly when you're using flame okay so once again with this view if we come down to our menu bar down here we've got you know different ways that we can look at this area so at the moment we're looking at it as desktop reels uh, we could also look at it as a free form desktop which means that we've got clips so we can kind of just move these around, which is also kind of fun as well. 
let's move that one down into the same reel go back to free form and you can see that I've now got two clips and these you can grab and kind of rescale as well so there's two ways you can look at your desktop free form or desktop reels um, but if we go further down this you can see that we've got then options for different ways of looking at it as a player so you can see here if we go for player it now shows me that big blue clip it's not very exciting I know um, in a big player and it means I can go through I can scrub in the bar I can actually scrub down here inside of the clip as well to navigate quickly backwards and forwards to these um, if you use the escape key which you can hear me clicking in the background that will toggle you through the last two states of the viewport so either the big viewer or the reels uh, and in some other modes um, if you're looking at something if you hit the key directly below the escape key the tilde key will always take you back to the reels view so for argument's sake if i was looking at this at free form for a second and i want to see all of my desktop if i hit the tilde key it will take me back to the reels view now sometime um, you probably don't want to keep jumping in and out of this um, so this is where the workspace comes in as a, as a really nice navigational aid right i can come in here and i can pick another clip and that will load that clip into the viewport and into the timeline so already you can see that there's many ways that you can manipulate a clip just as far as viewing it goes if we just look at viewing a little bit more sometimes you want to clear out some interface space so maybe you don't want to see your workspace um, panel all the time so down here at the bottom you can go through and you can actually go and hide it um, or you can show it or you could show it half height right so all of these little options down here change where it works you can also hold down at the control key on the left hand side of the keyboard and if you swipe you can hide the workspace panel if you swipe to the right you can bring it up on the other side and also hide it and if you swipe down you can also hide the actual timeline so once again I'm not going to flood you with too many things but certainly escape and the tilde key are very quick navigational shortcuts to get you backwards and forwards to your viewers so i'm kind of a little bit bored with color bars and blue so it would be a nice idea now to get some uh, some footage in from the outside world okay uh, once again and this is where the workspace panel comes into its own because really regardless of what kind of view i pick in the tabs as you can see here my workspace panel always stays consistent uh, and that's also true when I go into my media hub view okay my media hub view is like I said my portal to the outside world and this is also um, a good place to show how we can use the workspace panel to import and later on export footage so in the default mode uh, the browser is in file mode and this is really going to show you all of your drives that are either internal or attached or on the network to this particular workstation so I'm going to navigate down to storage media, uh, my flame intro and my uh, footage for uh, that I'm going to be sort of playing around with. Now we're using quite a bit of stock footage here. Um, I'm going to give you some links at the, uh, the end of each video um, so you can kind of have a look. There's some really good ones uh, that we've been looking at in the course of making these videos. Uh, so ones of note are uh, mazwide.com. They do some really nice uh, footage there. You can sort of download di lots of different resolutions. Uh, Pexels.com is good as well. Hollywoodcamerawork.com. And we're going to be looking at some uh, Photoshop stuff as well, which was from um, allfreedownload.com PSD. So some good footage there. Back to the task. Um, our Media Hub allows me to bring in footage into the system. What's quite nice about this is that like we were scrubbing on the desktop, you can actually go through and scrub all of these little clips, even though they technically exist in the outside world. And if you want some more information about these clips, um, if we uh, double tap on them, it will bring up a preview window, so we a slightly bigger view. And this is also where it reveals all the metadata. Now, I'm not going to slavishly go through everything that's here, but this also gives you a lot of good information about the metadata that's on the clip, the format, etc. We've also got a button over here that allows us to completely 
take over the whole interface and view this in full screen. And this is also available inside of um, the main desktop area as well. This is really nice if you just want to review your clips nice and big, you can go and play them through. Now at the moment, as I said, we are referencing all of these from the outside world. None of this is actually in the system at the moment. Once again, if I hit escape, it's going to restore my interface to the Media Hub. Now when we start importing footage, Flame will take care of a lot of the settings for you. Okay, so it's going to be aware of the resolution. It's going to try and work out what the frame rate is for you. Um, but down the bottom, there's a couple of tabs that you probably want to keep an eye on. So the general and format specific options are a pretty good idea um, to have a look at when we start working or importing footage. We're going to look at um, clips with alpha or not alpha in a, in a second, uh, but essentially all these drop downs allow you to bring in either multi channel clips or clips with mats, or sometimes you just want to ignore the alpha channel completely, especially if you're working with things like ARRI footage. You always think there's a, a white alpha channel, and that gets kind of annoying uh, when you're importing that. Um, all the resolution, bit depth, scan mode, ratio, everything to do with the clip is by default set as same as source. So Flame is going to try and identify, and once again, if you double click on this, the resolution, frame rate, etc., and automatically set those settings for the metadata on the clip. If you want to, you can come down, you can monkey around with these, but generally same as source unless you run into problems is the best thing. Um, the color management, which we touched on very lightly when we created the uh, the project, um, we're gonna leave at the moment uh, to tag only, and we left it as uh, the legacy, which effectively is gonna bring this in as, as unknown color space. The tagging is gonna be unknown. Um, like I said, color space is a whole separate really video tutorial so i'm not worried too much about that at the moment the only thing you may want to have a quick look at though is the format specific options so once again we've got predominantly things like uh mobs here mp4s etc and um, apart from the resolution um, etc and the scan mode um, sometimes when especially when we're doing conforming um, there's going to be metadata inside of here that we're going to need to correctly conform the, the media and the XML, the AF or the EDL. So once again, most of this is set by default to try and read from the header, um, you know, tape names, time code, the frame rate. But once again, if you run into difficulties or if you get corrupted metadata or clips with no metadata at all, you can obviously then come down here and start selecting some of these entries to uh, either take it from a slightly different place for file name or actually manually enter uh, some of those criteria yourself. We're all getting a little bit too caught up on ourselves. Uh, what we really want to do is start bringing some of that in. So uh, what's nice about this is that you can, you know, control click, you can multi-select clips. Uh, we can select all clips um, or we can go through and just select in this particular case, just a couple of ship numbers. Now, once you've got them highlighted, uh, you pick them up, you can see they, they're kind of like a ghosty transparent stack on the end of my pen and then we can decide where we want these to go now I want these to go into a separate reel on my desktop so I'm going to drop them there and you can see that now at this stage flame is now aware of these clips and where they live but we have actually just soft imported them we've just actually made a link to where they live in the outside world we're not actually copying or caching those internally at the moment so now we've got some media on our desktop um, as is usual, there may be some media there that we don't actually want anymore, or there may be something we want to do with the media. So this is very strange if you've come from um, other compositing or other editorial uh, pieces of software, is the way that we, we get rid of clips, the way we delete things. Now, of course, you can kind of come in here, and we can uh, right click and we can just go delete. But as we saw when we started doing the swiping, and if we swipe that way, we can actually get to our player without hitting the hotkey at all. Um, Flame is a very gestural interface. So that means that as, you know, as well as actually using hotkeys, we could just hit D for delete and delete the clip. But normally what we do is we pick up a clip which allows us to move it. Now we could move it into the timeline a bit later on. Or for us, if we go right the way down to the bottom of the interface, you can see there's a little trash can appears, which means that we throw those clips away. And you can kind of do this from anywhere. Um, so if we undo that for a second and we look at our workspace panel, uh, we can actually pick those clips up and we can throw them away from there as well. And then Control Z will kind of bring them back as well. So quite a gestural way of working with those. So we're going to throw them away for a second and we're just going to take one of these clips up uh, here for a second. 
Now, as we saw before, we can go through and we can kind of scrub these. We can kind of scrub on the timeline as well, which is nice. Uh, but the desktop allows us to do um, a couple of things uh, which you can't kind of do in other applications quite visually. So if we look on here, uh, we're going to have some hotkeys. Uh, so this is not really going to really appear in any of the contextual menus. Uh, but what we can do is that we can kind of, if you think of this clip as being a bunch of frames, and those bunch of frames at the moment are all collapsed into a stack, uh, which is kind of like this representation of the clip. Now, if we hover over that clip with the cursor and hit C, we can actually expand that out to be each individual frame. We can go and kind of go through and look at those frames. It's, we can navigate here, we can navigate there, but you can see that basically we're, we've got each, a representation of each frame. Now, what's kind of fun about this is that when you're in this view, um, there are some areas where you can sort of touch down and grab and hold and effectively split the clip up. So here what I've done is I've actually split this one clip into two clips. If I do the same here again, I've actually now got a clip. I've got a single frame and then I've got another clip. So if we just collapse all of these down for a second, you can see that I've got clip, static frame and then another clip. And you see that when I tap on those clips, it loads the corresponding timeline at the bottom of the interface. Now, if I just um, uncollapse all those clips again for a second, and we're just going to go back to this one, and we're just going to uncollapse that as well. Um, what we can actually do is we can do editing in the same way. So the same way that I sort of cut them apart, if I grab hold of this clip and I come to here, you can see that my cursor kind of changes color. So if I go into this, I've just cut that onto the end of that clip. If I pick up this uncollapsed set of uh, frames and I drop it onto here, I can now bolt that onto here. And then you can see that the representation down the timeline is that I have, if I hit C to recollapse them, I now have three clips bolted back together. Front clip, single frame, end clip. So the desktop is very useful in being like a gestural way to do editing. Now we're just going to go through and um, undo those for a second. We're just going to put everything back into one long clip. Um, the other thing that the, the desktop is also good for when you're looking at managing media and clips is deciding on um, you know, what section of a clip you kind of want to use. So when you're putting timelines together manually or maybe you're doing a bit of manual editing, uh, this is kind of a, like a nice way where you can start using the desktop tools to help your system doing things like that. And before we do that, that's going to obviously start bringing us on to some editorial tools. So let's kind of have a look uh, down the bottom of the interface at some more options that we have. So the options down here, um, your uh, ripple, your non-ripple modes, uh, these refer to actually when we start working with timelines um, in this area. So when we look at the next video, when we're putting together some manual sequences and doing some conforming, these buttons will be very relevant, but sometimes you need to do some uh, work on the sources, uh, you know, just to duplicate or extract some things. So you, if we do uh, a right click on here, you can obviously do copy, cut, paste and duplicate the clips. But flame is pretty gestural, as we can see, and there's hotkey methods of doing this that make it quite fluid. So um, if you hold down the alt and shift keys on the keyboard, you can see that little plus appears over a clip. And then when we drag that off, we've got a complete duplicate of that particular clip. Now, this particular clip as well has some ins and out points on here. And if we can kind of scrub in here, we can see them. Um, if we go to our full screen viewer, so our standard viewer here, um, you can see that we can set in and outs with buttons. There's some hotkeys for these, but at the moment we're going to use the button. So we're going to set uh, a new shorter in and out there. We're going to come back to our desktop. And this time, if I hold down uh, Control and Shift, you can see that I get a plus in between brackets, which means I'm now just going to extract that sub clip between the in and out points. You can see here that I've got my ins and outs are still available. Um, the last one, which is really nice, is that if we go to a particular frame, maybe you need to extract a frame for a freeze frame. You can see this is pretty useful in editing or for retouching. If you hold down Control, Alt and Shift, we can actually just extract a single frame from that sequence as well. And all these can be used as a source uh, for an edit into a sequence. 
So before we leave the sequence, and we've got a pretty good feel for getting into Flame, uh, bringing some media in, manipulating it on the desktop. But obviously at some point you're going to want to exit the software or you're going to want to save what you're doing. So how do we actually do that? How do we say things? So at the moment we've been working on uh, just a generic desktop called desktop. Um, once again, if you come into here, uh, we can go through and rename this desktop. And we're going to call it Ships. And tap down. So this desktop now contains everything I've done. You know, manipulating some clips, some sub clips, maybe some edits, and I want to save this. So this is where um, the library structure comes in. If you think that this desktop is a construct of reels with media and setups on, um, the same way that we can drag media around in those reels, I'm just going to replace that for a second. The same way we can drag things around on those reels, we can also grab this desktop and save it down to a library. And you can see here, when I've done that, it actually gives a representation of that ship desktop. And if I expand the folder down, you can see at this current moment in time, this is a sort of an exact mimic of this desktop right now. Now that's saved inside of a library, I can actually come up here, I can right click on my desktop um, header and I can clear the desktop which will reset it back to default and there's nothing there. And at this stage you can kind of use as a very flexible working mechanism. So you can do some work, you can save it in a library or you can iterate into a library with incremental updates, clear the desktop, work with some other things. When you want to go back to a particular stage or you want to go back to another desktop, uh, you can literally drag that back out and here onto that desktop and it will restore everything back as you had it at the point at which you saved it. So very, very sort of flexible mechanism. It's kind of like bins within bins. You have a desktop bin, which is where you're working, and then you can kind of save that into a library or in fact create new more libraries um, to which to petition up and version out your work. The button down here, save, does exactly the same function is me dragging things down. If I hit save down here, it's going to say, where do I want to save this particular desktop and the destination I want it to be in? And I can, this is just another way of doing it. You can actually hit this. It's going to go back into the default library, but this time when I hit save, it's going to say, hmm, that already exists. What would you like me to do? Do you want me to replace it? Do you want me to rename it? Do you want to add on top of it? So generally, this is a good way to iterate things through. So you could go, Oh, I just want you to replace it and at that point it's going to update that library folder inside of there as well. So this is saving desktops to libraries. Um, but if you want to save the whole project, so that means the desktop, the current state of it and everything in the library, this is not the save you're looking for to paraphrase um, a Star Wars prequel. Uh, the one you want is actually under the flame logo which says save project which is control S. So now it seems a little bit confusing, uh, but you have two sort of states to save in. You can do Control S, which just literally saves everything, libraries, desktop and setups at this current state. Or you are going to be taking um, either desktops or clips and saving them into a library structure, which will save them as like individual atomic items. So it will take a little bit of getting used to. Um, but, you know, if you remember, Control S is pretty much like if you're working on Word or After Effects or Premiere. Um, there's an auto save function as well. But, you know, when you do anything of significance, Control S saves literally everything that you're looking at. And then you've got the saving um, items, saving desktop, saving clips and reels into a library structure from which you can restore them at a later date. So I hope you enjoyed that. It's been fun doing this section. It's uh, it's not until you actually start talking through this, you realize how much is actually in here. Um, try and digest it all in. And in, in the next video, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be building on this and we're going to be looking at making actual timelines and conforms and working a little bit more with that media once we've got it in the timeline. So from me, uh, Stuart, uh, we'll see you in the next video.